Good afternoon, everyone. We have plenty of seats up front, so feel free to come on down. Uh, we're mainly using this mic for recording purposes, so I'll pass it on around when folks who are speaking. Don't expect me to suddenly speak in booming stentorian stone, uh, tones. Uh, please do me a favor, and cell phones killed, vibrating, shot, whatever. I'm fine with all of the above. Uh, my name is Andrew Greenberg. I thought we'd do introductions first of the panel, and then... Uh, we're going to get going with this. I am uh, executive director of the George Game Developers Association. I'm the conference director for Siege and uh, a big fan of the work the Entertainment Software Association is doing. And I will pass this to my right. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, good. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. Asante Bradford. Very excited to be here. Uh, I'm with the state of Georgia Department of Economic Development and the Georgia Film Music Digital Entertainment Office. And I am uh, Alex Cantatori. Um, I am a marketing producer at High res Studios. I'm Tom Folks. I'm the Vice President of State Government Affairs for the Entertainment Software Association. And I'm Richard Dilio. You guys can call me Rad. Um, it's a long story for a nickname. But uh, I do all of our membership and research at the ESA. So some of you know that I've been a game developer since 1990, and I've been a big fan of the ESA the entire time. And that's not just because my games have been some of those blamed for causing horrible traumas to children over the years. Uh, the ESA has done incredible work on our behalf, not just on censorship, but on a lot of other issues. And the one I think is not recognized enough is their efforts on building this industry. Uh, supporting the industry in a lot of different ways. One of the things that they do and that we have begun to do as well is to really start surveying what our industry is. And that's a big part of why this, uh, this panel is, this, is called The Future of Your Industry. We have to know where it is now in order to build a bigger and better one. That's been a core focus of the ESA and it's a core focus of the GGDA as well. If you were here at our investment conference on Friday, you got to hear us talk about our recently completed economic impact report. I'd like to recognize Dr. J. O'Toole from Georgia State University who's hiding in the back corner over there. But. Uh, Thank you very much for all your work on this. We have passed some of these out. I'll have more of these uh, sheets going around in the, uh, later on. But it really does show uh, an incredible growth in this industry. Now, we've been doing these surveys since 2012. And we've shown some very significant numbers, but that's because in the past, we included what uh, the, we in the video game industry often call the real money industry, which is the gambling side of things, scientific games here in Georgia, World Touch Gaming, Cadillac Jack, et cetera. So we were able to show uh, an easy $1.9 in impact, but we felt that it was time to get a real baseline on the video game, PC gaming, mobile gaming market, excluding those. And that's what Jay has put together and done a phenomenal job on. So I, I think the numbers are great and, uh, and really show an amazing growth. So when, back uh, when uh, Turner Interactive and a number of other studios shut down in 2000, we were down to two computer game companies in Georgia. By 2005, we skyrocketed up to eight. And now one of the things that Jay's uh, work has shown is that we have 113 active game studios in uh, Georgia now by the e ESA's... Uh, count that puts us now in the number seven spot in the country so we have been shooting forward all the way along the things that i find even more exciting than the number of studios the number of people who are actually working in this we count 3142 employees working in the video game industry in this state and in there's a, a calculation you do that starts showing how many jobs are supported by the industry both part-time and full-time and we get to almost 12,000 jobs in this state that are uh basically tied to the game industry. Uh, we show that they are earning 200, over $200 million at an average salary of more than 60, of about 64,000 a year. Uh, we show 350 games being released out of here, and we show a direct economic impact of $278 million in this state from the video game industry. And because there are calculations you do to show how much impact an industry really has, it's not just how much you spend, there's more impact above and beyond. We show a total of $550 million in impact to the state of Georgia from the video game industry. And that is a significant growth over the past 10 years. In the 10 years we've been doing Siege, we've just seen it skyrocket. And it really is on behalf of you guys who are doing the work, 
the people who are supporting us in the work, and those folks who bring the industry together, because none of this is done solo. Everybody who works head down on games in their basement knows they do better games when they're working with the team, and that's true on building an industry. And the bigger the teams are and the stronger the teams are, the better we all do. And that's why I'm so glad to have the Entertainment Software Association here to talk about the future of our industry. Why don't I just, um, we don't, I know we only have about uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, but I, so I just want to talk briefly about ESA. If you're, if you're not uh, as familiar with ESA as Andrew is, and thank you for your uh, very generous comments about what we do, um, we're, the, we're the trade association. We're based in D.C. We represent the video game industry. Um, uh, we have currently about 36 members. You can correct that number if I'm... 30. 35, 36. Um, and uh, as you know, those are household names, uh, generally uh, speaking. Um, but uh, as Rad, and uh, it, that is his name, that's what we call him around the office, I swear. Because um, he's Rad. No, those are, those are his initials, and uh, and uh, he is excellent to work with and has been really helpful here. Um, but the... Uh, but the, the, uh, but the, the numbers that you have there um, and are... are are incredible, and congratulations to you and the uh, GGDA um, on on that analysis. And currently, ESA is doing a, a similar analysis nationwide, um, uh, because one of the things that we want to do is is help people understand how big the industry is uh, and how much reach that it has, not just in Georgia, uh, but in areas around the country. Uh, and that's one one of the things we do. You, you mentioned our uh, fight over content that you know went on for uh, well over 20 years. Um, we had the, um, the Supreme Court decision uh, back in 2011. Uh, uh, which we are very happy with. Uh, we also, uh, we were talking earlier today, even more important, I think, to uh, to the industry and its history um, is beyond the um, uh, the Supreme Court decision uh, was the uh, was the reaction um, the industry received following uh, the Newtown uh, shootings and uh, and how the industry uh, came together and the organization uh, really had to lead us uh, as an industry back out of that. Uh, rather than taking a, a step back five, ten years, uh, we were able to change that conversation and move forward uh, away from uh, conversations around content. So uh, now I walk into state capitals around the country and, and, and you know, some people will bring up uh, violence in games, but uh, it's a peripheral issue rather than a, a center uh, target that people want to talk about. So um, I'm an expert in state government affairs. I'm not an expert in game development, uh, but I do spend a lot of time with members of the industry uh, and learning more about what you guys do. Uh, I am in awe of it. Uh, I think it's incredible. It's an amazing way uh, and creative way to tell a story, uh, and I enjoy playing games um, uh, with my kids and, uh, and by myself. So uh, it is a, uh, a great outlet for me as well. Um, so in that expertise in, in state government affairs, um, it's my job to tell a story, uh, tell your story uh, to people that matter, that are making decisions that impact your business on a regular basis. Uh, and we use a lot of different tools to do that. Uh, a lot of it, though, is just showing up uh, and us uh, being in the right places with the right people at the right time. Um, and uh, we have a network around the country of people that are local. Uh, we have uh, uh, Miss Misty Holcomb, uh, who Andrew works very closely with here in Atlanta, who represents ESA. Uh, she is at the Capitol uh, most of the time, uh, and she has great direct relationships with all those decision makers. Um, so if you ever need anything uh, on that front, uh, let us know. Um, Another uh, person that we work very closely with uh, down here is Asante Bradford, and uh, um, he is one of the people that understands more than uh, any in the state of Georgia how important um, this industry is to economic development. Um, I would love to pass it over to him and have him talk a little bit about uh, the current incentive uh, here in Georgia uh, and uh, how that can benefit anyone um, uh, anyone who's interested in this room and how we can, um, as an industry and, uh, and partner with uh, here in Georgia, uh, continue to sustain and grow that uh, program so that we can do the same for the industry. I'll turn it over to Mark. Number seven? <laughs> Weren't we number seven last year? <laughs> man, man, we got we getting a little bit better. Oh, but you said you are doing an on one right now. Okay. <laughs> top five, top five, top five. You got to put a hit out on Illinois. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get them. Um, and I just want to uh, basically say what Andrew said, and I agree. This is definitely a collaboration effort from all of us, and I see some of the game development companies as well have been a, playing a big part 
And what Andrew and uh, you guys have done at GGDA has been amazing. So I know you never get your pat on the back, but there's one today. And ESA, man, you guys have been, since I've been on nine years now, and you guys have been me since the beginning and been very educational for me, learning a lot too. And um, as I was sharing too, we, we're still educating folks because this industry changes so fast. So um, we've had the tax credit, the one that we have in place now since 2008. Has, we had one in 2005, but it was uh, we had like maybe five companies that did it. Um, but now, since we've done it one in, since 2008, it's been going great for not just obviously in a, uh, digital entertainment, but all, obviously for film and TV, which is doing great too. So we're real excited it was going on. Um, right now, so we have a basic 20% tax credit, and then at the uh, there's an additional 10% if you put the little Georgia logo commercial you guys might have seen on some of the TV shows or some of the games, local games that you have seen here. So we're pretty excited about it. Um, there hopefully will be some additional changes this year um, that Andrew's been working on, and we're pretty excited that that's going to continue and actually get a little better for us as far as recruiting. But what's really exciting to me, and when you hear these numbers, is that's been organic growth. That's been actually a lot of startups, a lot of you guys getting a couple of your friends together and deciding not to go to L.A., San Francisco, Chicago, and these other places. <laughs> Which has been great. So that was one of the reasons they actually created my position, was to keep you guys here, get more companies coming here. What's also happening because of these, these numbers is the big boys are reaching out to me now. They're, that, which is amazing because they can't afford not to, they can't afford to miss out on this opportunity. So what's, the other thing that's happening is the tax credits has always kind of been the driving piece. But now what I'm saying is it's talent. And now with all you know the universities, and we got to get those numbers because it was 11. It's probably more now. And I know you've had two universities in Savannah that have actually came on. So we actually probably have more like 13, 14 schools that are now actually teaching this curriculum, which is great. So the other thing I want to talk about in with my position real quick, and I'll end up, I know we have a short time, um, by me being in place, I was talking about how this industry changes so fast. So we've seen almost really to me like last week we saw this huge change in what's called esports and you guys most of you guys probably know all about that so right now that i know of we are the only one that actually incentivizing that that's but it's the broadcasting part of that and i'm really excited about that because guess starting to get those calls from different companies that are interested in that um then we have a couple of announcements that happened last week as well so real excited where that's going to be tom i think that's going to help us get to that top five position there um, and the other thing, obviously, is the whole virtual reality, augmented reality, Mitch reality thing, and we, are, we actually have incentivized that as well. So uh, as of now, we are the only states that are actually incentivizing that, and I hope to continue that as long as this keeps changing, this industry, that we are able to move that quick and hopefully turn our boat a little faster than some of the other states so we get in the top three in about two years. Thank yeah, and I just want to emphasize what Asante is saying here. Not only do you get financial incentives for making good video games here in Georgia. We're also seeing that for eSports and for virtual reality. This is a, our goal has been to drive uh, Georgia into being a leader in the 21st century, and it is those efforts specifically to make that kind of thing happen. Our, we did not include schools in this survey. I'm sorry we didn't. That's going to show another huge economic impact as well as when we did the survey before. We showed 2,000 students in this state studying game programs and game-related programs, and still most of them went out of state to work. That's been a big part of what we've been trying to change, and I'm really looking forward to tracking that. If I could chime in on the tax credits real quick. Um, so at High Res Studios, uh, we've grown tremendously recently. Um, we're at about 270 employees now, and I think we have another 70 job recs out right now. Um, and the reason why we've been able to grow here in Georgia rather than hiring um, outsourcing is because of those tax credits. Um, they have, it's made our leadership a lot more comfortable to hire people here in Georgia full-time jobs to grow our esports scene, at the, at the very beginning, we were running uh, Smite Esports, Paladins Esports, through outside uh, providers like ESL, MLG. Um, we took it all in-house. We built our own in-house esports arena um, at our studios in Alpharetta. Um, and we have teams there right now from, uh, from Europe competing in a regional finals for Smite PC um, that we flew out here. And it's all possible because of these tax credits. If it wasn't, they'd be going to some other country or state or you know we'd be outsourcing it and it wouldn't be jobs here in Georgia yeah and high res is the first company to actually get the esports tax credit <laughs>
That's excellent. Uh, one thing on, on the incentives, um, you know, these don't happen in a vacuum. And, uh, you know, there is uh, pressure from, you know, outside areas that are um, uh, th that make them um, necessary uh, and also make them effective. I, I will let you know that, that Georgia right now, um, I would say, has had the most consistently um, um, valuable program in place for the longest period of time. Uh, we saw Florida as actually the state of uh, Florida. The legislature there um, did not renew their tax incentive last session. Um, so that is an unfunded program at this point. Uh, Louisiana, uh, if you're following the, um, <laughs> if you're following any of the, uh, any of the politics in, in, uh, in Louisiana at all, you know that they are uh, the facing a major deficit there. Uh, the former governor, um, they said, uh, not just sliced uh, into the, uh, sliced uh, everything uh, down to the bone. Uh, and so now they are ha having to reevaluate all of their uh, budget decisions and uh, every incentive in Louisiana took a 28 percent hit. Uh, uh, they think that they will keep the program in place because they do find it valuable to the state of Louisiana, but uh, others will, other incentives will lose, uh, and just 28 percent down is, is going to hurt them uh, generally. Texas, uh, Texas made a big, big mistake uh, last their last legislative session, not this year, not this past year, but the year before, they only meet every two years. They dropped their incentive from ninety million dollars uh, per biennium, so that's for every two years, ninety ninety million dollars. They dropped it to thirty five uh, million dollars. Uh, they have seen a significant de decrease uh, in in movie and video game uh, development because of that. Uh, but Georgia uh, has continued uh, to fund, uh, you know, uh, six, um, sorry, so, uh, sufficient. Uh, over the last uh, several years and uh, so there's a, a consistency there that is valuable uh, to the industry that they understand that it's going to be there and that they can count on it and they can plan moving forward so that's really important um, I think there, uh, one of the things we, we've talked a lot about up here is uh, is change uh, a lot of change very quickly in this industry um, and I don't know that that was always the case for video games uh, I think it's you know um, you know there's always been uh, a little bit of a shifting we've always kind of uh, pushed the edge um, uh, as an industry uh, but that has really the now the marketplace is really uh, changing a lot around uh, video games and they're uh, competing and they're, they're doing very well in that space but I want to turn over to Alex and kind of we were talking earlier about uh, um, kind of the shift in, in, in demographics and the shift in um, advertising and, and how are you reaching those individual players? I think the audience would be very interested to hear that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that the things that we're seeing is that, uh, you know, kids still get interested in games at a very young age. The, the difference is probably that their parents were gamers too, so um, it's not completely hated out. Um, and, you know, once you reach a certain age, you kind of don't have as much time to be a gamer anymore. You know, you have kids or... You know, you have to do yard work or boring, boring life stuff. Um, but the interesting thing is that this new generation of gamers are engaging with games in a different place than the previous generation. Um, obviously, for, for many young people, you know, phone and tablet are their primary computing and gaming destinations. Um, you know, we do a lot of PC and console gaming at high res. We do a little bit of mobile, but um, mainly PC and, and console. Um, and the way that you reach people has changed. Um, you know, it used to be that you could run Facebook ads. You still can run Facebook ads, they're great. Um, but the younger generation, they're on Snapchat, they're on Instagram, you know, they're on different platforms. Um, and if they're on Facebook, it's probably to see what their crazy racist uncle is doing. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's a very different, uh, it, it's a different, different world now. Um, the other thing too is if you are, reading the news on your phone, uh, if you're looking at Twitter on your phone, um, and I service you an ad to download Smite. You, you click on it, you think Smite looks really cool, I'm gonna play this game, sign up for an account. By the time you get back to your PC, a lot of times you forgot that this game looked really cool and you wanna go play it. Um, so it changes the way that we message things. You know, We have to do follow-up emails saying, hey, remember you signed up for this cool game, you should go play it. Um, but our conversion rates are a lot lower for users that we hit first on mobile versus we hit first on PC. Um, so I think that's why you see so much of, of the market shifting to mobile, because that's where this younger generation is. Um, it, it's a platform that has its own challenges in making money. Um, it's even harder to surface because there's one store that everybody's trying to fight for space on. Um, and it costs even more to kind of get up there unless you happen to be just exceedingly lucky. Um, but uh, it's just, there, there will be new platforms in the next years. And 
I think the people that get into the ground floor of those are going to be the ones that we talk about as the great success stories in the years to come. Thank you, Alex. Um, talking about some of the new platforms, um, I think you know Rich has a great perspective on virtual reality. Uh, but in addition to virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, esports, uh, these are all issues that come with their own challenges from a public policy perspective. Uh, and so it's uh, infinitely important that we are, uh, and Rich is really our, our conduit, uh, you know, into the uh, into the industry and to talk uh, generally to to people within our industry and kind of. Find out what those challenges are, where they're hearing, what's next, who do we have to educate next on, on these things that are, we're talking about. And Rich can talk a little bit about how he does that. Yeah, happy to do that. So in the room here, how many people are working on VR, AR, MR, something or other? Have tooled around with it? No. So obviously, um, the big concern for VR and AR and MR, and oh, by the way, we really need to come up with a good name for all of that, because I cannot keep saying it. I'm going to say it backwards one day and look like an idiot. So if anyone has a suggestion for a better name for that, let me know, and I'll give you the credit. Um, but anyway, you know, traditional concerns for video games were content concerns. You know, this game has this in it. I don't like that. Um, I personally believe that that is probably going to happen again with VR or AR or MR. Um, and so we are always paying attention to these things because it's very important. Uh, you know, you might say to yourself, well, I'm, I don't plan on making games that have, you know, this content or that content. It doesn't really matter. Uh, as we saw with, with uh, Pokemon Go, you have folks who have a lot of power and authority talking about things and they frankly don't know what they're talking about, right? This is like the internet is a series of tubes, right? So imagine internet is a series of tubes telling you what you can do in your industry. Exactly. I mean, it's funny, but it's also kind of terrifying, right? So um, those are the kinds of things that, that we're always keeping an eye on. Uh, the other thing that I do at ESA is I do a lot of research. And uh, like I, I just did a, 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 a pretty big survey on PC gaming. Um, and we'll probably make some of this public at some point. But, uh, you know, we ask questions like, what was the first PC game that you remember playing as a kid? By the way, what does everyone think the most popular answer was to that question? I heard it once. Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail, right? That's the most, that game was the most reported as the first game that, that most people remember playing on a PC. I remember playing it on an Apple IIe when I was in, you know, when I was six, I think. God. Um, <laughs> it's too late. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're always asking these questions, and we ask these questions not because it's fun to know the answers, and it is, you know, uh, but because it can help us chart a path forward. You know, I remember when everyone was saying consoles were going to kill PC gaming. Everyone who says that, who said that now looks kind of silly, right, because we know that's not the way the industry's headed. So the only way to really know these things is to do the research, which, which we're always happy to do. Um, and our research is driven by what our members ask us to do. So... Uh, and one other question for everybody in the room. Is there anyone here who's not uh, based in Georgia? Did you come from somewhere else? Okay. Um, ESA, if you go to our website and look at who our members are, ESA is not just Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo. Right? We have a lot of members. They work in all areas of video games. Um, so if you're interested in membership, don't think, oh, that's just for the, for the big companies because it's not. And uh, you know your concerns, whether you believe it or not, are probably very close to the concerns of some of our larger members because they worry about content, they worry about tax incentives, they worry about how the industry looks to outsiders, they worry about champions, they're worried about VR. So all the things that you know would impact your business would also impact theirs. Um, so I, th I think that's it for you know sort of what we're looking at in the future. You mentioned um, the conversation we had last week about um, sorry about. <laughs> about uh, the Supreme Court decision and VR and the oh, real estate. Yeah. That's really important. So interestingly, I don't know if you guys have ever had a chance to read the Supreme Court decision. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ex exciting reading. Um, but if you have a minute, read it. And it, what becomes very clear is that the justices in, in some cases were hedging their bets because they understood at the time that the First Amendment question about video games was contingent upon the level of technology as it existed in 2011, right? And all of the evidence that was put forth to the judges, and not just the Supreme Court, but at the state level for 20 years before that, was based upon, are video games, you know, immersive, and, and what level of immersion and, and uh, do they create, and what does that level of immersion do? Usually, 
when they're talking about kids. Um, there's an answer to that, right? Nobody knows what that answer is for VR. And so the content and the censorship questions that were settled in 2011 could very well pop up again when VR and AR and MR become mainstream because we're talking about a new level of technology. So the one thing I would say is, you know, and we certainly don't do this at ESA, but don't get cocky. Don't rest on your laurels because the censorship and the content arguments uh, could very well start happening again. They happened with Pokemon Go, right? Uh, sort of in a different way, but same old story, same old problems, you know, same old concerns. So uh, we're not immune to those. You have to be constantly vigilant against that stuff. So. Oh, right. And this is the... Uh, uh, the other part with VR. Um, I don't know how it hasn't happened yet. Do you guys remember when we came out and people were throwing their controllers through their TVs, right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, somebody in their living room is going to be playing, uh, you know, or in their basement on their PC, which is where I would be. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to crash my head through my desk, play with, because, you know, because I have my headset on, and I'm going to get too excited, and I'm going to fall out of my chair and whack my head, right? Someone's, that's going to happen to somebody. And they're going to want to sue somebody else. That's going to happen, right? Um, how many of you have actually played with, with VR headsets? Right? Anybody here get nauseous? Yeah. This is still a thing. Right now, it's not an insurmountable, unsolvable problem, but it's still a thing. And one or two dudes are going to throw up in their living room, you know, and uh, something's going to happen from that. We don't know what, but, uh, you know, and there's uh, folks already talking about concerns about, you know, what can happen to your eyes if you if you use a headset for too long? Now, these are all valid concerns, but just because they're valid concerns does not mean you let, um, you know, a, a fanatic derail the conversation and shut your industry down because somebody threw up in their living room. Right? There's a middle ground to be walked between. You know, nobody want nobody in the game industry wants to hurt anybody, but neither do you want. Uh, the internet is a series of tubes guy running your industry when he's probably never worn a headset and he never will. So uh, those are all also issues that we're, you know, we're very, paying very close attention to. Thanks, Rad. That's uh, really helpful. I think that uh, probably was a uh, surprising conversation that I don't know that, that a lot of people are thinking about yet. But uh, that's ESA's job, uh, and, and that's what we're doing on a regular basis. We're thinking about those things. Uh, you may not have heard it here in uh, Georgia yet, but uh, city of Chicago is taxing streaming services. Uh, that'll include your Netflix account. Uh, that includes your um, uh, your Xbox Live subscription, uh, those type of things. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a challenge, um, you know, to us. Do we become the next, uh, you know, phone company? Is your is your Xbox Live or your PlayStation 4 a bill going to look like your phone bill? Um, you know, and uh, the city of Chicago actually did it a very interesting way. Uh, they didn't pass a new tax they actually just redefined the existing entertainment tax in the city of Chicago that was created for the World's Fair uh, back in the early 1900s. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Um, and so, uh, but this is this is what states are looking at. As you're seeing um, uh, the shift in physical taxes uh, into a, a digital world, um, and uh, you're, they're, the states are losing, the governments, uh, local localities in the state uh, governments are losing that revenue that needs to be replaced in some way, and so they're coming up with new and creative ways to do that. I'm not saying that this that services generally should not be taxed in any way, um, but let's make sure that we're not the ones that they're trying to, um, you know, replace all that revenue with. So um, it's part of a conversation. The state of California already uh, has over 40 municipalities that are looking to pass the same exact uh, tax. Uh, three already have. Um, and so now there's another almost 40 uh, that are looking to do that in the next few years. So we're trying to come up with a plan here on, on how do we address that. So those are the things that, uh, that keep ESA up at night and, uh, and uh, make sure that uh, you know, we're, we're inserting ourselves into that conversation on a very regular basis. Um, any questions from the audience? Anything that you guys uh, have at this point want to talk about? There's someone back there. Yes. Um, I'll repeat the question for you. Uh, 
So the question uh, from the audience member uh, was about the ESA Foundation and using um, ESA's um, um, influence uh, to talk about other social issues. And, and uh, I definitely think that's something that, that we do. Red, do you want to talk a little yeah, bit I about think, that? Uh, well, just one thing. I believe that we did screen or we're getting ready to screen that dragon cancer um, for a bunch of legislators, right? So, and this is exactly the kind of thing that we like to do because, you know, I'm incredibly proud of everything that the industry makes. Uh, I like Grand Theft Auto. I like Skyrim. Uh, I love Dark Souls. But I also really like the stuff that's off the beaten path or the stuff that's not necessarily made by a AAA company to, to talk about social issues. And that's, a you know, an example of the kind of things that, that we do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, the limitations we have on the, the ESA Foundation side is, um, you know, the amount of money that we can raise for the foundation and, and then, you know, where do we put it? I think that we have been very specific in the way that we use um, those uh, resources on the uh, foundation. And I think we, we do use them a lot in the education space. Uh, and and uh, we do. We're believers in the transformative nature of, uh, of video games and, and the compelling stories uh, that you're able to tell through video games. And uh, uh, we believe that, uh, you know, issues that you brought up and, and others are important to this conversation. Did you apply for the ESA Foundation grant? <laughs> really? Come. I got, a, I got an A the last time, but I still wasn't funded. Come talk to me after. <laughs> He's not allowed to hand out money from the foundation. Just saying. <laughs> uh, the other thing I'd like to add, just real quick, um, especially as a as a nonprofit, um, it, to try and get the word out about that about your game. I know you said you know you don't have a budget for it. Um, I would try and find a PR agency that's willing to do any kind of pro bono work um, because for something like that, that's the kind of a story that can latch on to a lot of different agencies. You know, they'll pick it up and they'll run with it because that's a great story. Um, and, and a little bit of PR could go a long way in getting the word out about your game. What about uh, influencers? Um, how are you using oh, yeah. influencers? Would they be able to use influencers? Yeah, so um, I think that Especially for a game like that, too. Uh, so influencers, if, if you're not familiar with the term, is uh, Twitch streamers, it's YouTubers, it's people that are big on Twitter or Instagram. Um, and a lot of the times, especially for big games, you have to pay them to play your games. It's not the way it used to be. You can't just be a cool game and they figure, it, they find it and they play it. You know, if you want Lyric or Soda Poppin or uh, you know PewDiePie to play your game, um, it is going to cost you a lot of money. Um, the one exception to that sometimes is super small indie games. Um, if you have some kind of an interesting hook to your game, um, sometimes if you catch them on the right day, you can get them to pick up your game and play it. Um, it it's hard to do, uh, but especially if, if they read an article about it on you know, Kotaku or wherever, um, and they're like, oh, that, that actually sounds like it could be cool, like, the kind of thing that I want to share with my, my viewers. Um, for you particularly, since since it is this kind of sensitive topic, um, you know maybe you look for streamers that have a reputation for really engaging with their community to uh, raise money for charities or something like that, um, because those are the kind of streamers that are more receptive to something like that. Um, you know, it's obviously great if you can get PewDiePie to play your game, but um, you know it's going to cost you a million bucks. So uh, it, you know w w our work with influencers, um, we were kind of fortunate with Paladins. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Paladins. It's our new game. Um, and uh, the general consensus on the internet is that uh, we ripped off Overwatch uh, completely, and it is an Overwatch clone. Um, it, it's actually completely different uh, if you actually play the game. But um, uh, Dunkey, who's a major YouTuber, uh, made a video about how Paladins is an Overwatch clone, and it got more than 2 million views. Um, that is the kind of free advertising that we could not have afforded to pay for. Um, and because his video got so popular, a lot of other uh, kind of second tier YouTubers picked it up and made their own videos about how much we're ripping off Overwatch. Um, and uh, you know, once the, the media focus was on us and they were asking, you know, why are you ripping off Overwatch? Um, then we could come back and show, you know, actually most of these ideas have their origins in our previous games, in Global Agenda, in Smite. Um, you know, uh, Yes, the games look a little bit similar. I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna argue that, but they look similar because they were started at development forever ago and we weren't gonna change our whole graphical style just because Blizzard announced Overwatch. Um, so uh, we were able to get some free influencer stuff out of that, but even still, if there are people that we wanna work with, like we have to pay them money. We have people that come to us and say, yeah, for three videos, uh, that'll be $800,000.
Um, in, and that's what the big boys in this industry are paying. Um, you know, if, if you think, oh, hey, uh, this streamer I like just picked up this big game because he wanted to. No, somebody paid him. The Division paid a ton of people. Um, you know, Destiny paid a ton of people. Uh, it, it costs a lot of money to become a viral sensation um, unless you get really lucky. I'd actually like to jump on what Alex said to, to segue a little bit to another uh, issue I think is one of the big ones facing our industry, and it ties in a great deal to what you, Drew talked about. So Drew runs these game jams for people who to make games to address teen dating violence. He's built up this excellent community of people involved in this effort. Uh, and, of course, now we're talking about community, about how they can both build up a game, attack a game, and so on. And what I'm seeing more and more of is... Basically, everybody is now a gamer. So when we're talking about community, we're talking about almost everyone, and it, it begins to subdivide. And now we start seeing publishers and developers being, um, I guess, I don't want to say blame, but being tied more and more to what their community is doing and being held responsible to the actions of its community. And this is something I think we as an industry need to take on and really focus upon. The more that people say try and go back to, I think it was a recent Donald Trump quote about their, they're in their, base, their parents' basement again. And we, so we have to deal with these sort of innuendos and these sort of negative asides as to who everybody in this room is, um, the more difficulties it can cause us. And I think there are some people still who are even more knowledgeable about the industry who are going to try and assign blame to publishers, to content providers for the actions of the community. And this is something I think that both within the GGDA and within larger organizations, we need to be keeping a close eye on because in the future, it is our community that will define us more than we define our community. And I want to add to that. One of the things that uh, ESA is looking at right now, uh, we're sort of an odd bird when it comes to trade associations because we don't really offer certification. The reason for that is, is that we don't need to tell you how to do anything. And, you know, like we don't, there's nothing I could certify anybody in this room to do that you need us to certify. Uh, but one thing we are looking at uh, is a community management best practices that we would be able to disseminate, you know, to the industry. And, and so, you know, at the very least, if, you know, something goes south in a forum somewhere and, and you know, people are, are talking and, you know, and then representative Umpty Scrunch uh, says something, you know, and, and they want to talk to, uh, you know, the owner of the company or whatever. At least they can say, listen, these, these are standards that the industry abides by, and we're following them. And that's really important because those kinds of standards exist, you know, uh, for all sorts of other things. We don't really have them. I think it's partly due to how young the industry really is and how organically it, it's just sort of to, to grow into the size that it is. Um, but I agree uh, the, the community aspect is really important. I think, especially in the last two years, companies have really um, realized how important community managers are as parts of a, a company organization. They are, in many cases, the conduit through how they speak to uh, their fans and their consumers, and it's a really important job. It's sort of this... Any community managers in here? Okay, it's sort of like a weird mix of PR and uh, being a, an advocate for uh, gamers and consumers. So I think that's only going to get more important as you know the, as the industry gets bigger. But I agree that's it's an issue that's it's not going to go away. It's not going to go away. So you think maybe Pokemon Go could have used a uh, good community manager in the, in the launch? I don't know how you manage that many players. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that, that, you know, very, very interesting. And, and uh, you know, to add on to what Rad said there, um, you know, the best defense is a, is a really strong offense. And, uh, you know, w you know, you follow that line about, um, you know, doing things in advance of uh, someone telling you to. Um, that's not the play we used for the ESRB. Actually, we were uh, forced into uh, having to, you know, have that robust rating system uh, because we were had a lot of outside pressure, and uh, we did thankfully create, um, you know, the the strongest uh, rating system uh, for the entertainment industry that's out there, and uh, continue to uh, uh, to grow that. But uh, it's important to kind of look at those issues um, as they're emerging uh, and address them, and and uh, you know, the esports, the virtual reality, uh, those are a lot of the things that. Um, that are consuming ESA these days, and, and how do we address those, and how do we, um, you know, kind of um, put us in the best possible position um, to, and I don't want to say defend, but to communicate or to advocate or to educate uh, on these issues so people have a better sense of, um, you know, uh, the role that it plays in society and the economy and things like that. You have something to add? Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, I, I'm glad you brought up the ESRB because as much as many of us do not like rating systems, I think that the ESA really worked to create what is the best process out there, not only because it's such a strong, well-recognized, everybody understands what T means system, but also because they work so closely with developers to fine-tune the whole system of going through the uh, ratings process to make it work well for everyone. This is a real issue around the world with all the other rating systems. You don't know how they work, why they work, if they work. But uh, the ESRB works very closely with the IGDA and others, the, especially the IGDA's anti-censorship special interest group, to make sure that developers knew what was required, knew what they were being judged on, knew how the entire process worked, and it wasn't hidden behind a veil that they could make it as transparent as possible. So it doesn't just work to protect stores. It doesn't work just work to protect consumers. It works for the developers as well. And I think that's the standard that needs to be applied not just in ratings, but really in anything that involves that cross-section of consumers, distributors, and manufacturers, producers, us, the folks who make the games. And I think the way the system they set up to run through the ESRB is a is going to be an important one moving forward as we start dealing with things like how what what blame does the uh, publisher have for the actions of the community moving forward uh, into virtual reality and online communities and so forth. And so you're talking about ESRB, but uh, you know on the on the uh, package games, but also on the mobile. Is that where you're? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. I mean, everyone here familiar with uh, the mobile um, rating system of ESRB? Not everybody. Some people. So uh, ESRB created, I guess it was 18 months, two years ago now, IARC, uh, which is international uh, rating. So every storefront, with the exception of one major storefront uh, that I think we all, we all know, um, has agreed to participate in IARC. Um, and uh, what IARC is, is uh, it's free to developers. Uh, it's actually for mobile games, uh, so that you can load uh, your mobile game. Uh, whether it's Google Play or um, um, you know Verizon storefront, wherever it is uh, where, where you do that, with the exception of Apple, um, because Apple has its own rating system, um, which has been continually criticized uh, by, by others. But uh, the iARC system, if you, um, if you upload it, uh, upload your game to that storefront, it automatically receives uh, an ESRB rating for the United States. But in addition, it receives a rating for the six other international jurisdictions around the world automatically um, so that you can sell your game internationally from a mobile marketplace, um, uh, all created uh, in alignment with developers, uh, with those in the industry, um, and their 20 years of rating games. They've come up with a uh, very efficient system in which you answer questions regarding um, uh, the the play and the uh, content of your games, and they give you a uh, a rating. And uh, you know you need those to be on those on those storefronts, and uh, that's how they're able to do it. So uh, I think that's an important aspect. Um, do you have experience dealing with the ESRB? Is it kind of something not not my uh, job? Okay. Uh, uh, another person in my department does that. All right. So, uh, All right. They, they seem happy with it. <laughs> listen, th listen. If there if there was no friction, uh, it would be a problem because it wouldn't be effective enough. But uh, with the right amount of friction, the right amount of uh, back and forth between uh, the self-regulatory body uh, and the industry, um, you know, we can effectively make that case uh, that this is the right way to do it, and this is uh, what consumers want and need. So. I think what's one of the things that's important is the experience they have in working across all these uh, involved parties uh, in the process. I mean, when I'm working on a game, that all these various issues from tax credits to uh, to legislative to, to to censorship and so on are the last things I want to be thinking about. But unfortunately, someone has to be, and it has to be a group that really understands the entire process. And the fact that they've been able to work on so many fronts so effectively, I think, is a really telling tribute uh, to the people behind it. Uh, thanks for that, and absolutely. And, and again, um, we want members of the industry to focus on um, on their craft and on making on ga making games. And uh, uh, as the trade association representing the industry, uh, we will be concerned uh, with those things. And uh, obviously, from input from you, uh, help uh, defend and uh, tell the industry story. Any other questions out there? Uh, from uh, that's a big segue off of Drew's question. <laughs> <laughs> right here.
I uh, so the question uh, the question from the audience was about um, uh, how games are made um, um, uh, are are made uh, remotely uh, in a lot of instances and and different segments of the game are made in in different ways or uh, and I believe you this is how uh, you have different studios that focus on different aspects or different. Um, uh, their strengths and you know add those to the games. Uh, I believe because it's a per project basis. Is it? It's eligible here on Sunday. In, yeah, so it is. It is eligible here in Georgia uh, for you to do that because that's the way it's it's set up as a project. And it, across the board, I don't know of any other of the 21 states that have incentives that would exclude that. Um, so the the work has to be done in the state of Georgia or in whatever state it is. Uh, but if you're using um, Georgia resources, Georgia employees, um, you're eligible for that incentive. Even if the ultimate game uh, is finally packaged or, or uh, you know, uh, put out by another company, the work that's done in the state is incentivized, as long as you hit all those parameters as far as spend, employees, things like that. As far as incentives. Is just, that, just yeah, this is actually something that Georgia has addressed directly. So the game industry, while we're handled under the entertainment, uh, so the entertainment credits that apply to movies, we have some specific limitations that don't work with movies. Because movies, they figure you're filming them all on site here in town. You're at Screen Gems. You're down the block shooting on a street. With games, they understand that there can be an issue. So the basic... Um, the basic measuring mark is what is your Georgia payroll. So that is the first step to qualifying for the credits. And uh, if they are going to be claiming uh, the credits based on the amount you're paying your workers, which is the main thing that we're doing in this industry, that's our main expense, that's what they're looking at first. Then there can be other spend items added onto it. But payroll is the number one thing. I don't know of any other state that really focuses on payroll to the extent that Georgia does. Um, only that that's kind of already happening now. And I think um, like uh, one particular company here in Georgia is one of our largest ones. And, you know, they have another office, in another place. But usually what they do is they look, you know, what's what makes sense as far as talent and incentives for them deciding where to actually do that production. So I think kind of the industry and a lot of the independents I know are already doing that as well. And may, maybe they don't qualify for the credits already. But to anticipate it, no, I think that GDA has already kind of done that as far as the payroll and everything like that. And as long as that spend here is above that threshold, you know, you can still go ahead and have that. So you're right. It is. Hap I think it's already happening, actually. But you hit on something that is one of the greatest threats to the payroll, which is any fear of fraud that's, that the Georgia is giving credit for something <laughs> happening in Texas or something along those lines. And that's not only the legislators' fear. That's the industry fear. We want everyone to know this is... Georgia money going to support a Georgia industry that will go on and support a state. So everybody does need to keep an eye and ensure that if a state is giving a credit, that state is reaping the benefits of things that are being done there. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So I, th I think that, uh, to Asante's point, is that, that it is, it's happening already, and, and the industry is, is set up there. I know in, in Texas there's a specific company uh, that their specialty is uh, artificial intelligence, and they do that for a number of different titles, but they are eligible for that incentive. So I think to, to answer your question, uh, it is front of mind, and we're addressing it, and we understand that's how the industry is made up, and, so, and that's how it will keep moving, and it will still be eligible for incentives. Had another question back here? We have, again, through our foundation. I'll, I'll let, uh, I think Rich has uh, a couple things with Extra Life. And yeah, I mean, we've raised millions of dollars with Extra Life, so that's the, we work with them a lot. Uh, the ESA Foundation every year does Night to Unite for Kids, which is in, um, we changed it last year, so now it runs concurrent with GDC, so people who are already in the area can, can uh, get a table at Night to Unite, and all of that directly goes to fund the ESA Foundation, and the ESA Foundation is set up to provide scholarships. We do two things. We provide scholarships uh, for women and minorities who are looking to get into game development programs in colleges. 
Uh, and the other thing we do is we provide grants for uh, social games, educational games. Uh, there's, you know, there's uh, rules to how we can fund them and what we fund. Uh, but, you know, so those are the, the, the two big areas where we focus a lot of our charity. Uh, and then, of course, our members have very robust corporate uh, giving programs. Uh, EA has a, has a pretty large one. And, you know, they run the gamut. You know, uh, Activision, oh, God, I hope it's Activision, not EA. Uh, Activision um, with the uh, uh, Call of Duty endowment. Okay, I said that right. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, um, then you, Wounded Warriors, we bring uh, veterans to E3 every year. Um, I'm a veteran, so I appreciate it. I think that's nice. Uh, so, you know, we do a lot of different things, a lot of different areas. Uh, but, yes, as far as people, and, and we do field a lot of requests from uh, outside charities who, are, who say, hey, can you, can you work with us and promote our stuff or help us raise money? And sometimes we can and sometimes we can. It's, it's just a matter of, of having the, the bandwidth and, frankly, having the cash to do it. So. Uh, Hi-Res Studios also does a lot of charity work. Um, just uh, last year, for we created a special skin for the character Scylla and Smite um, that benefited Child's Play. Uh, we raised two hundred and forty-four thousand dollars for Child's Play through skin sales. Um, we previously have done skin sales that benefited uh, the Red Cross. Um, just this year, we had a one of our pro players was diagnosed with cancer, um, unfortunately. Um, and we raised $80,000 to help him's treatment through a kind of a live streamed event where people could donate to make us do silly things like pop balloons full of gross stuff on our faces. Um, it, it, you know, it, it really, I think that, oh, and also most recent one, uh, we just did a little charity tournament for a new game mode in Smite um, where people could compete for different charities and uh, ended up giving away about $55,000 to different charities. Um, the winning charity uh, was Connor's Cure, which is uh, WWE's uh, pediatric cancer charity. Um, so, you know, I think that if, if charity is something that's important to you as a developer, um, you can just do it. Uh, you know, if you create some kind of in-game content or say to yourself, you know, we're going to be a game developer for good and commit to giving 5% of our proceeds away to charity or something, like, um, do it. And the community will respond and they'll really be happy about it. Like, uh, there are a few things that we do that make our fans happier um, than when we give away a big check at SWC and, uh, you know, bring some Make-A-Wish kids on stage and stuff like that. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to give some money away because it, it comes back to you in other ways. Thank you, Alex. So, uh, kind of just to, do you have a follow up? Uh, do you guys know of any? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I think that um, I think that w what Rich said earlier about um, specifically about extra life and those those type of things. We're, we're always looking for for those type of opportunities, and and we are. Yeah, I mean, I'll hear anyone's pitch. Honestly, if you, if you have if you're running a charity, if you're trying to get a charity off the ground, I'll I'll listen. You know, to your elevator pitch and 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 direct it towards you know the appropriate person. If if uh, you know if I think there's a fit there. Um, yeah, so the question was, what do we see about the future of educational gaming? I, educational gaming is uh, sort of the rocky of video games now because it's just, they're just, they keep getting up. Um, the, I think the, the biggest hurdle for educational games right now is that, I know as well, <laughs> is that there's no educational games marketplace that's well known enough to cut through all of the red tape that an educator has to deal with, right? So you're an educator, and y you go find this really cool game, and you say, I want my kids to play this game in my class. Well, do they all have iPads? Well, no. So let's say you get them all iPads. Well, then you got to get it past the administrator, and then you got to get it past the superintendent, and you got to convince the superintendent why you should be buying 30 copies of a video game. Uh, I do not envy you your position in that conversation. Uh, so that has traditionally been the, uh, the biggest hurdle. The other hurdle is... The games themselves, I think, because for so long, to go back to what I said before about Oregon Trail, the great thing about Oregon Trail was everybody knows what dysentery is because everyone died of it. <laughs> but 
You don't know. You didn't learn what dysentery was from Oregon Trail. You just know you died of it, right? So to go, why did I? What's dysentery? You had to go look that up. And the game was not beating you over the head with dysentery or what a wagon tongue is, right? <laughs> you had to go learn. You had to go figure it out. And I think that people are uh, developers are learning that that is the role that games can really play in education. Not necessarily teaching the raw material, but getting uh, students interested so that their you know, horizons get broadened and, and you know they take it from there. I, I hate to say this, I, I do want to make sure one of you gets down to the coffee break. You, you, we're starting that in a couple minutes, oh, and yeah. it's sponsored by you guys. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. if you want to take a lot of these down. And well, yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I would add on the educational games is, uh, is that yeah, no, I I think that there was some theory or some uh, uh, some thought that you know we could insert ourselves into as an industry, insert ourselves into video games, and and definitely some how we've tried to uh, you know um, kind of make the educational games as appealing as the commercial entertainment games, and it's a really difficult proposition. Um, but you look at, uh, but I think that in some ways it happens. Um, it happens by itself. I mean, look at civilization. Uh, you know, look at all the things that people learn or learn from that, or learn about world history, or or, or, or um, uh, you know, st strategic thinking and, and that type of stuff. So I think that has that ability. Uh, I think the implementation in schools is really difficult. Uh, we partner uh, with the state government affairs program through uh, ESA partners with EverFi. Um, I think that's the, one of the other challenges too is that you see a lot of educational games from a nonprofit perspective um, because making money is dirty um, when you're trying to help people, um, which isn't necessarily the case. You can be profitable and helpful. Um, and so EverFi is a for-profit, and they do uh, educational games, and they uh, specifically tailor, um, they, they actually tailor the content using games. So uh, they started with financial literacy. Um, they wanted to teach kids about financial literacy. Actually, the um, financial services industry was required uh, to teach uh, generation about a younger generation about financial literacy about credit cards things like that so everfi actually stepped into that void and they used games to engage students on these issues uh, they've taken a step further we actually sponsor a program uh, called digital literacy uh, where our digital citizenship that actually teaches kids how to behave online so uh, you know downloading games um, or downloading games or downloading um, uh, songs or music or other IP uh, illegally uh, is a crime uh, and we're teaching kids that so that it's not like oh eh, no harm no foul no actually you're stealing from a creator there and someone who created this uh, is owed some compensation for it and you know by stealing it uh, you're denying them that so we're teaching those type of things we're also teaching about the information your online footprint that type of stuff and then we take it a step further to uh, teaching kids inspiring kids to what Rich said about um, STEM related careers um, you know so we have a major drop off uh, in uh, women in STEM related careers and it drops off in you know eighth ninth grade where they decide to look at something else or another career and we have a game called radius uh, that everfi that put together and it encourages um, women and minorities so we're targeting men and minorities with this game uh, about stem related careers and what oh this really interests me this is what I have to study to get there so I think there certainly is a role in educational games I don't know that um, they're ever going to compete for consumer dollars um, I think the red tape issue uh, about getting into the schools, EverFi has addressed that. They have got a network of staff around the country that works really hard to get, uh, works with the school administrators and the counties and uh, the Board of Education and, you know, get themselves in uh, there and they do a really great job with teacher training. I'm, um, I'm real excited where virtual reality is going to go with education and we're starting to see some of that already. Um, and then the other thing I want to brag about is here in the state of Georgia, um, I actually met with Department of Education last week about getting unity into some of our school systems now, which is great. We've, uh, we've done pretty good on the animation side. We actually have five counties that are doing that in the animation side. Um, but I'm real excited, too. They're real excited. And they already have the classes designated and everything. So I think that's real exciting as well as we start getting in, actually doing that inside the schools. All right, I'm going to go ahead and Call us to a short cut uh, close if you don't mind. There's more questions to be asked. Join us over at the ESA coffee break coming on up. Bring your appetite, bring your questions, and make sure to pick up the membership brochures. Thank you all for joining us today.